Hello, I'm Glenn Sage, interim pastor of the First Christian Church in Galax, Virginia. Uh, today, uh, we are going to have our worship service uh, virtually because of uh, another snowstorm uh, is forecast for us during the uh, early morning hours, and uh, we're supposed to have um, anywhere from three to seven inches of snow. So our church service has been uh, canceled for this Sunday. So we're coming to you by way of uh, YouTube. And um, for today's uh, message, uh, we're, we're uh, having a message based on uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 3, verses 16 through 27. And uh, our sermon topic is uh, making the, the uh, tough calls. And uh, all of us throughout life have had to make uh, difficult calls uh, that uh, regard decisions that affect basically us. And at times we've had to make uh, difficult calls that uh, have a profound effect on a number of other people. And uh, so one of those who made the uh, one of the best tough calls was uh, Solomon. And uh, Solomon, of course, uh, was the son of David. And uh, he was uh, blessed in that uh, God gave him three choices as a young man. And uh, the uh, choices were uh, that he might uh, be rich or that he might be uh, famous or that he might have wisdom. And so he chose the third. He uh, asked God that he could have wisdom so that he might rule his people well. And so because he made this uh, uh, decision, which basically was good for others rather than just himself, uh, God said, well, I'm going to give you the other two uh, uh, decisions as well, that you're going to be wealthy, you're going to be famous, and uh, you're going to have uh, wisdom. So uh, here in this passage of Scripture, uh, Solomon was placed in a position of judgment, which was not uncommon among the, uh, the Israelites and uh, many of the eastern kings of that era. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he often made decisions over small practical matters that, uh, that came before him in the kingdom. And uh, we know that uh, leadership over Israel had uh, often been responsible in these kind of ways. Uh, one of the uh, people that uh, had responsibility or assumed responsibility for making uh, decisions of judgment when there was a difference between the children of Israel uh, over this very smallest of matters, and uh, this was Moses. Moses was uh, 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 was leading the children of Israel through the wilderness experience, and uh, he uh, he had the people to come before him uh, so that he might judge over them uh, about particular areas of disagreement. And uh, there were so many of these that uh, Moses uh, got very little rest. Uh, he was uh, kept up uh, about all night long and would get up early the next day, and that was a a crowd of people waiting for Moses to uh, make judgment about decisions over him. And uh, so uh, at one point, his uh, father-in-law observed this. And sometimes when we're in the midst of decision making, we're very short-sighted or we don't see the whole picture. And so it's good to have people that we trust that can come in and intervene and help us. And uh, so... Uh, uh, Moses uh, listened to his father-in-law Jethro. Jethro says, you're not going to be able to continue on at this kind of pace. Uh, you need to uh, get some rest. Moses, of course, was 80 years old when he started on this journey. And uh, by the time he finished, he was 120 years old. So Jethro said, look you out some judges from among Israel and let them govern over the smaller matters. And then if something can't be resolved at that level, uh, then bring it on up to, uh, uh, let them bring it on up to you and you, you make the final judgment over difficult matters. 
And so basically our court system here in America is based on this same kind of principle. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, a court system at uh, the local level, non-federal, uh, non with, uh, uh, with the circuit court. And then we have uh, courts of appeals. And um, then we eventually can go all the way up to the Supreme Court if they felt like that it deserved a hearing from them. And so rather than the Supreme Court trying to make a decision over ever small matter, only the major concerns go before them. And uh, so it was with Moses. And uh, so in making decisions, he took the advice of his in-laws. You know, a lot of people uh, resist uh, suggestions by their in-laws, but Moses was, uh, was wise enough to listen to, uh, uh, to uh, his, uh, uh, his father-in-law and, uh, and uh, made a decision that was very helpful in ruling over the, uh, the kingdom of Israel as it moved about the Sinai Peninsula. So uh, uh, we, uh, we all need to... Uh, to heed this kind of example that Moses set before us. And uh, in addition to what uh, Moses did, uh, David uh, also made judgment over important matters. And uh, he did this both in civic matters as well as religious matters. In Israel, the, the two were sort of merged together. And one day a knock came on his door and uh, so he, uh, uh, his servants answered the door and uh, he found out that Nathan, the prophet, was there to see him. And uh, he was honored by the presence of the prophet and uh, had, had him invited in. And the prophet said, David, I have, a, I have a matter of judgment for you, a decision that you need to make. And uh, so little was David aware that this decision-making concerned him personally. But uh, Jethro presented it in sort of a parable that, uh, that David did not recognize himself in the parable. And he said that a man had, uh, there was a certain man in his kingdom who was uh, very wealthy and had fared, fared well and, and uh, had huge flocks and lots of land. And uh, this man uh, had uh, a servant who had one little yo lamb, and uh, he loved this lamb. He uh, he uh, evidently uh, slept with the lamb. The lamb uh, was uh, w was very close to uh, this individual, and um, so a guest came to the wealthy man's house, and so the wealthy man, rather than going out and picking out a lamb from his flock and and slaying it and feeding this guest. Instead, he went down to his servants, took this lamb and had it slayed and fed it to his guest. And the scripture tells us that David was very wroth. He rose up in anger and he said, this man shall surely die. And he's gonna to have to pay back several fold that which he has taken from his servant. And so then uh, at this point, the prophet spoke to David and said, David, thou art the man. So David made a decision about himself, not knowing that, uh, that he was the person who had uh, perpetrated this particular uh, crime. And the crime that David had uh, perpetrated was uh, he, uh, he stole the wife of one of his uh, troops, one of his soldiers, and uh, he had an affair with her, and she, uh, she was with child, and uh, sent up to David and said, well, David, uh, we've got real problems. I'm with child, and uh, my husband is out in the field fighting with the Philistines, and uh, so it's going to be obvious that, uh, uh, that he's not the father of the child unless <coughs> unless he comes out of the field and, uh, and spends some time with me. So uh, David sent a message uh, down to the troops, down to uh, his commander, uh, Joab, 
and said, uh, I want you to send uh, Uriah the Hittite up to my palace to, uh, to talk with me and visit with me and give me a report on how the battle's going. And so Uriah came up to the, uh, to the palace and gave David a report on how things were going in the, out in the field. They were, they were uh, encamped about a Philistine village. And um, so uh, they were besieging it, which is a, a very powerful tool of warfare where they uh, didn't let anybody go out of the sealed city or anybody come in and therefore they denied them any kind of supplies. So basically they were trying to starve them out rather than storming the city. And so uh, Uriah gave him a report and uh, David uh, said, well, that's, uh, that's wonderful. I want you to uh, take a little leave, go on down to, uh, to your house and spend some time with your wife. And uh, then you can go back to the field. And so uh, uh, Uriah refused this. He said, uh, no, he said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. The army of Israel is in the field. And so how in the world can I go home and spend time with my wife when all the other members of the military are there involved in this conflict? So uh, David uh, sent him down to his house. And the next morning, he got a report from his servants that uh, Uriah the Hittite didn't go down to his house. He, um, he just slept out there outside the, the gate to the palace. So uh, David brought him back in and got him drunk. He uh, fed him a meal and uh, gave him plenty of wine and got him drunk and sent him out the second time. And the second time he did the same thing. He just laid down, went to sleep, but he didn't go visit his wife. So David had a real dilemma. So he, he wrote out a message and gave it to Uriah and said, I want you to take this to Joab. Uh, these are instructions for him. And so the message basically said, uh, I want you to take Uriah the Hittite and, uh, have him to go with some of the bravest men up to the wall of the city and also to the gate of the city. And uh, once they arrive there, uh, I want you to uh, uh, withdraw from Uriah and leave him alone and let him fight the battle by himself and then give me a report about what happened. So sure enough, Uriah went down there, gave a note that was basically a death warrant to Joab the general. Joab read it, and being a faithful servant, he carried it out just like David had instructed him to do. He took Uriah the Hittite up to the gate of the city, and, uh, and then the rest of the troops withdrew from him and, and left him there, and uh, he was slain. And so a message went from, jo from Joab back to David saying, well, David, uh, uh, we uh, tried to... Uh, uh, launch an attack against the city and uh, they were stronger than what we were and uh, they slayed some of our soldiers and Uriah the Hittite is dead and so at this point David felt like his problem was solved because nobody but he and his faithful general really knew what had taken place but then that day when when uh, uh, when the uh, prophet uh, uh, came, Nathan came and knocked on his door. He wasn't aware that this was something that God knew. And so therefore God called into question his conduct. And so David uh, threw himself on the mercies of God. He says, I've judged myself. Uh, he wrote the 51st Psalm uh, as a consequence of, of this action. And uh, because of this, God said, uh, I'm not going to take your life, but the child that uh, Bathsheba is carrying, which is your child, is going to die. And uh, you're, you're not going to uh, be able to raise your son. And so uh, this happened. And uh, David uh, was in mourning when his child became ill shortly after its birth. And he... Uh, threw himself on the mercies of God and, 
he uh, laid prostrate on the ground, uh, praying to God, and then then the servants came in and uh, really hated to tell David because he was so upset about the sickness. And now, how was he going to respond to the death? And so David surprised them all. Uh, at, at the news of the death of his son, he rose up and went out and washed himself. And he sat down and he ate. And uh, some of his uh, servants said, well, David, we thought that you would really be crushed by this experience, the fact that uh, your son had died. And uh, David said, there's nothing that I can do to bring my son back, but I can prepare to go and be with him. And uh, so David made some bad decisions, and the decisions that he made brought consequences to his life. And so it is with decisions that we make as well. There, we may even be forgiven of wrong and bad decisions, but in spite of that, there's physical consequences in this life for what we do. And uh, David learned that in a hard way. So uh, this was an important decision in David's life. Also, uh, as we look at the uh, Old Testament and some examples of decision-making, there was a, a couple of ladies that lived in Moab, and uh, one of them was, uh, was an Israelite, and her name was Naomi. And uh, she had a daughter-in-law by the name of Ruth. And uh, Ruth and Naomi got along real well together, and they suffered a common tragedy. Both their husbands passed away. And so uh, in the midst of their sorrow, they had to make a decision about what they were going to do at this point. And it's real hard to make good logical decisions in the midst of grief. But sometimes we, we have no control over the circumstances that uh, surrounds the timing for important decisions that we make. And so uh, Naomi says, well, I'm, I'm going back to Israel. Uh, that's, that's my homeland. And uh, so... Uh, she uh, kissed both of her daughter-in-laws. She, uh, uh, she had two daughter-in-laws, and uh, one of them decided that she was going to stay in, uh, in Moab. And uh, the uh, other daughter-in-law said to her mother-in-law, uh, I want to go with you. And her mother-in-law tried to talk her out of it. She says, uh, she says Ruth, I have, I have no more sons to give you. Uh, and so uh, you need to return back uh, to your, um, you, you need to stay here with your kin people and uh, make a new life for yourself. And Ruth turned to her mother-in-law and said, wherever thou goest, I will go. And wherever thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people. And thy God shall be my God. And so after this kind of answer, Naomi took Ruth with her and they traveled back to the Holy Land, back to the land of Israel. And uh, as they were traveling to the heart of Israel, uh, it was harvest time and, and they uh, noticed that they were reaping. And so uh, this was a real opportunity for the two ladies. And so uh, they went out into the field and they began to glean. And uh, gleaning was, uh, was, a, uh, was a circumstance that was set up in the law of Moses. It was set up in order to uh, give uh, uh, passers-by, those that were just traveling through Israel, an opportunity to, to uh, eat some off of the land, off of uh, some of the farmland there. And uh, for the poor people also to have something to eat. And uh, so this law uh, involved a couple of things. One was whenever they harvested a field, uh, they had to harvest it in a circular pattern. And uh, as they harvested it, they had to leave the corners of the field and the corners of the field could then be harvested by people that were in need. So uh, uh, Naomi and Ruth got out and they, uh, uh, did some cutting of uh, wheat and oats and grain of different types 
uh, because uh, this was uh, uh, this was uh, an opportunity for them to do that. And uh, also, the second part of that law was that as they uh, uh, shock these uh, uh, this grain up into bundles, and uh, even in, in uh, America here, uh, uh, 50 to 100 years ago, is uh, is uh, not not any further back than that, uh, people would go out and they would uh, use a cradle and they would cradle wheat and oats and uh, then they would reach down and uh, remove a, a bundle out of these cradles, tie a knot in it and uh, lay it aside and, and then they would build a shock. They would uh, lay out uh, 10 bundles in a vertical position and then they would take two bundles making an even dozen and they would break these across their knee and they would lay one on top of the uh, grain and then uh, 90 degrees from that they would lay the other and this this was called a cap block and this would turn the water off of the heads of the of the grain and would uh, and the, the uh, bundles would shed uh, water and so uh, uh, they they were bundling uh, the the grain in the field, and uh, when they loaded it on the wagon to haul into a barn, um, the law said that if any of the bundles fell from the wagon, that uh, that the farmer could not pick these up. These had to be left also for the poor and the needy and the wayfaring person who was passing through their land, and so. Uh, a man by the name of, uh, of Obed was uh, out there watching the harvest and he noticed these two ladies out in the field. And he noticed one of them especially was a very beautiful young woman. And uh, so he said to his hands, his field hands, he said, uh, uh, whenever Naomi and uh, Ruth are following your wagon, take your foot and kick off some fresh bundles and let them pick them up. And so uh, he was trying to look after their interest. And uh, this began a, uh, uh, a, uh, a love attraction between uh, Obed and Ruth. And uh, so uh, eventually uh, uh, Ruth and uh, Obed married. And uh, Ruth had some offspring. And uh, one of these was named Jesse. And uh, Jesse had a lot of sons. And uh, one of the youngest of these sons was named David. And so the decision that this Moabite, this, this woman from uh, Moab, made uh, affected her family lineage and also affected Israel's history in a profound way. Because one of the sons of Jesse was none other than David, one of the most popular and prominent kings in all of Israel's history. And so therefore, uh, she and one other woman are mentioned in the genealogies of Jesus. Uh, Jesus came from the lineage of, uh, of Ruth and Boaz. And uh, the other woman was Rahab the harlot, and Jericho. So there was two women in Jesus's lineage that were not uh, Jewish. And uh, so Jesus Christ was king both of the Jew and, and the non-Jew. So uh, this became an important decision that this woman made in her life. And so we're, we're con constantly confronted with decisions. But the uh, decision that uh, our scripture addresses today taken from uh, 1 Kings, the third chapter, verses 16 through 24, 27, uh, is a very profound decision. So uh, uh, Solomon was reigning over Israel, and, and so uh, one day they brought two women into his chamber and uh, uh, said, uh, King Solomon, here are two women, and... Uh, both of them gave birth about the same time. They, uh, they were pregnant about the same time, and they gave birth about the, 
at the same time. And, uh, uh, and the scripture tells us, and it came to pass the third day after that, uh, the woman is explaining what her position was, I was delivered, that this, this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. In other words, she uh, laid on top of her, <coughs> her newborn baby and, uh, and um, it, uh, it died of, uh, of uh, strangulation. And so she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while the handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. So uh, even at three days, the woman recognized who was her child and who was not her child. There was this, this kind of bonding between uh, mother and child. And she goes on to say, when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this they said, but no, no, but the dead is my son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. So here was this argument between the two women about who was the real mother of the living child and who was the mother of the dead child. And so uh, King Solomon said, well, uh, this is not going to be a real problem. Uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll ask my servants to bring my big broad uh, uh, double-edged sword in and we'll just cut the living baby in half and we'll give half to each mother and so the mother who whose child had died and she had stolen the other woman's baby said that sounds good to me that's a good way to settle it but the woman who really bore the living child said no no don't do that Go ahead and allow her to have the child. And so Solomon's answer uh, down here in verse 27 is this. Then the king answered and said, uh, Give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And so love made the difference. This woman loved and cared for this, this child. And so therefore Solomon was able to recognize that through this bond of love, she was willing to give the child up so that it might live. And so this decision that Solomon made spread throughout the whole kingdom and the people began to rejoice. They rejoiced because they knew they had a king who would make a just and honest judgment over them. And um, so, uh, as we make decisions, we need to uh, uh, to consider what the kind thing is and uh, what is truth. And um, so uh, uh, Solomon uh, demonstrated his ability to rule and to reign and to judge. And so uh, as we have to make decisions in life, one of the most important decisions that we make is uh, based on Acts, the second chapter, as the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost, they uh, said, uh, men and brethren, uh, you desired a murder to be delivered unto you, and you called out for the crucifixion of the Holy One and the Righteous One, and, and you had him killed, you had him murdered. And so the scripture tells us, and they were cut at the heart. So here, 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus, these men heard a message that held them responsible for a decision about what to do with Jesus. And uh, this decision was reversed for many of them. There were thousands that rose up and said, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And so the uh, apostles told them, you must believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized every one of you for the remission of sin and ye shall be saved, and ye shall receive 
the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so decisions that we've made earlier in life don't have to be a life position. And so uh, we would encourage uh, each one of you, uh, as you uh, consider decision making, think about the most important decision that you have ever made or ever will make. And that is what will I do with Jesus? And I would certainly hope and pray that the answer that you give is that you would make him king and Lord of your life. Let us join together in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for decision makers in the Bible who made important decisions for their nation. And their nation prospered because they made these decisions in a selfless way. And we recognize there were others who made decisions that were the wrong decisions. And therefore, they faced a lifetime of suffering and pain because of this. We know that they uh, entered into your kingdom uh, because they were forgiven, but there were consequences in their lives for bad decisions. And we pray that if there are any listening to our broadcast today, that they would reconsider what they have perhaps decided in times past. What would they do with Jesus? And they decided to do nothing. We pray that they might arrive at a position where they would embrace Jesus and make him Lord of their life. All of these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen.